Good evening, everyone. My name is Victor Sainz, and I'm executive director of the Houston Institute. I'm also a lecturer in the Rice Philosophy Department, where I regularly teach courses in the philosophy of religion and in ancient Greek philosophy. So I want to extend a warm welcome to each one of you to our debate tonight. I think we're really in for a treat uh, with Alex Byrne and Luis Anthony in our conversation tonight. Before I say a couple of things about our speakers, I want to give you a little bit of context about Houston Institute and the work that we do. Houston Institute is an academic nonprofit whose mission is to help the people of Rice think deeply about the best way to live. So the goal is to help students become better seekers and speakers of truth. Though Houston Institute is rooted in the natural law tradition with thinkers like Aristotle and Aquinas at our core, we engage with a range of thinkers and traditions in a fair-minded way. Any student interested in serious intellectual engagement in a spirit of friendship is absolutely welcome at our events. At HI, we aim to foster a culture that really values robust uh, discussion across ideological lines. And we really hope that tonight's uh, conversation is really a clear expression of this. We run, to give you a sense, we run about 50 or so student events or so uh, a year for undergraduates and graduate students. It's usually a lot smaller than this. So it's usually, you know, 14, 50 students over a meal and just having philosophical conversation. But on occasion, we run bigger events like we do tonight, and we try to share some of the work that we do with uh, members of the community. So our audience, to give you a sense of, of the kind of at the atmosphere we try to foster at HI, is really fairly diverse. So I'm very glad to say that our audience, audience spawns, uh, spans liberals, conservatives, Catholics, Protestants, Jews, atheists, agnostics, and a lot more. So it's really all over the map, and in a way that's by design. And But what brings everyone together is a commitment to seeking the truth about the most important questions in life. And I think what's true of students in our audience may also be true of the audience here tonight. So tonight we're going to talk about some pretty difficult, challenging topics, and I'm assuming that probably people in this room disagree and some of you pretty sharply about how to think about these topics, but I'm confident that we can do this in a way that's robust, respectful, you know, not polemical, uh, but analytical. So with all that in mind, let me say a couple of things about our speakers tonight. So uh, first, let me introduce to you uh, Professor Alex Byrne. So, Professor Byrne received his PhD in philosophy from Princeton University. He is a full professor of philosophy in the Department of Linguistics and Philosophy at MIT. His main interests uh, are in the philosophy of mind, especially perception, metaphysics, and epistemology. Also, in the last couple of years, he's been working on issues related to sex and gender. And he has recently finished a book on this topic called Trouble with Gender, Sex Facts, and gender fictions, which will be out in the UK in October and later in the US. So some of the work that we'll, we'll be seeing tonight has been the product of uh, Professor Byrne thinking very actively about these questions. Professor uh, Luis Anthony uh, received her PhD from Harvard at university and is Professor Emerita at the philosophy department at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Professor Anthony's work has focused on the uh, questions in the philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, and epistemology, and feminist philosophy. She has also most recently been interested in questions in the philosophy of religion. Professor Anthony has lectured at colleges and universities across the United States and in many foreign countries. She has also been a guest on the radio show Philosophy Talk and has contributed to the New York Times philosophy blog, The Stone. So I don't think uh, I need to tell you that you're really in for a treat tonight. Um, and something that was really interesting to me and just delightful was that as we were putting this event together, so I'm e emailing with Alex and uh, trying to plan this conversation. And as I suggest, uh, it's like, hey, why don't we put you in a conversation with Luis Anthony? He's like, oh, obviously, she's exactly the person to do this. 
so I come to find out, uh, I didn't plan this. I come to find out that these are, they're actually friends, right? So this, this couldn't be more perfect, right? For what we try to do at HI. It's like, hey, we can disagree pretty dramatically about really important things and still uh, retain this friendship that is rooted in the pursuit of truth. So uh, without further ado, so let me uh, introduce to you Professor Alex Byrne. Professor Byrne uh, will speak first, making his case for about 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, then Professor Anthony uh, will make her case for about 20 to 25 minutes. Then uh, we'll have uh, rebuttals from each party for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then we will dive in uh, to questions and answers from the audience. I will give you a little bit of instructions about how we're going to be doing Q&A, but uh, join me in welcoming Professor Alex Byrne. OK, well, uh, thanks very much, Victor, and thanks to the Houston Institute for inviting me. Um, it was a great introduction, although I can't tell you the number of talks I've been to where the speaker has really been uh, boosted at, at the start in the introduction, this and that honorary degree and being on this and that radio show and uh, this and that article in the New York Times. And then the whole thing is just like a total damp squib and a big letdown. So <laughs> seriously, the, the next time I would recommend setting expectations low. So <laughs> go wrong. Okay, so it's and it's a particular pleasure to share the stage with the um, distinguished philosopher Louise Anthony, vastly more distinguished than myself. And as uh, Victor said, I just started thinking about this stuff literally five minutes ago. <laughs> so the the title of this debate is um, the ontology of gender, which is a rather forbidding phrase, and it um, occurs in an even more forbidding text, Judith Butler's Gender Trouble, which was published in 1990. And here's the, the relevant passage. Uh, you need to read this carefully because there'll be a quiz later. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Luckily, there is no need to read it. I mentioned the title of this debate, The Ontology of Gender, only to point out that the question that, or questions that Louise and I will be trying to answer can be stated quite simply. Um, we don't have to mention the word ontology or even the word gender. I will avoid, avoid the word ontology entirely and mention gender only when I absolutely have to. This event is about the categories uh, woman, man, girl, and boy. And don't get hung up on the word category. It's just a convenient way of talking. So to say that Louise belongs to the category woman is just to say that Louise is a woman. The question we're asking is, what does it take to belong to the category woman? Or to put it more plainly, what is a woman? And then similarly, what is a man? What is a girl? What is a boy? Now, uh, clearly many people think that this question, what is a woman, is very important. After all, you are here. Um, but why? Maybe it's not, um, to borrow uh, Victor's phrasing, one of the one of the most important questions of our, of our time. Um, so pa perhaps it, it actually is of no importance uh, whatsoever. So I'm not actually going to say anything about that in my presentation. I don't think Louise is either. So we'll save that for the uh, question period afterwards. OK, so a bit more background before I turn to explaining and defending my view. Some of you will know this book by the French philosopher Simone de Beauvoir, The Second Sex, published in 1949. So this passage is from the introduction. I hesitated a long time before writing a book on woman that is womankind. The subject is irritating, especially for women, and it is not new. Enough ink has flowed over the quarrel about feminism. It is now almost over. Let us not talk it. Let, let us not talk about it anymore. See, this is like one of the worst predictions ever made. Uh, yet it is still being talked about, and the volumes of idiocies churned out over this past century do not seem to have clarified the problem. Besides, is there a problem? And what is it? I mean, you can tell that she's a philosopher, even though 
she claimed not to be one. Are there even women in the first place? But first, she says, what is a woman? And more than 70 years later, here we are. So an answer to Beauvoir's question was given on this billboard in 2018 by a British activist. Never mind why she was motivated to put this up. She cited what was then the Google definition of the word woman, adult, human, female. And for reasons we needn't go into, um, the Brits have been obsessed with Beauvoir's question even more than the Americans. So here is Keir Starmer, the leader of the UK's opposition Labour Party in April of this year. And we don't have to fixate on the penis, fortunately. What he meant was that only a tiny minority, one in a thousand women, are male. If he thought this was a happy compromise, well, he couldn't guess. He was sadly mistaken. So the Prime Minister of the UK, Rishi Sunak, uh, seized the opportunity, 0.1%. Um, so, and in fact, uh, Sir Keir quickly realized that his, he, he will very likely be the next prime minister. He, he quickly realized that his prospects of being prime minister uh, would be greatly improved if he changed his mind. And indeed, as a, a talented politician, it didn't take him long to actually change his mind. And a couple of months later, he endorsed the view on the billboard that a woman is the mature or adult female of our species. And as further confirmation uh, that Sir Keir was wise to change his mind, uh, his uh, headline from UK newspaper, The Daily Telegraph, um, from last month. The woman pictured, by the way, is Sharon Davis, who's a British former Olympic swimmer who has campaigned for female-only sporting categories. So as usual, the British provided more comedic value than the Americans, who were in any case rather slow to catch on to the what is a woman question. But they did catch up last year with uh, Matt Walsh's documentary, What is a Woman? One Man's Journey to Answer the Question of a Generation. And if you've seen the documentary, the joke is supposed to be that the answer is obvious. <laughs> a woman is an adult female human being, just as the dictionary says, even though everyone that Walsh asked in the documentary is unable to give that answer. So why exactly are we here? if the answer is obvious. Well, we're here really because the experts disagree. So here's a passage from the authoritative online Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, gold standard of philosophy encyclopedias. This is from the entry, Feminist Perspectives on Sex and Gender. Gender metaphysics, or what it is to be a woman or man, or alternatively, what, is it, what it takes to be a member of the category woman or a member of the category man is still very much a live issue. Most contemporary feminist philosophers still hold on to the view that gender is about social factors and that it is in some sense distinct from biological sex. And what that basically means is that, um, that's I'll explain shortly, most feminist philosophers think that there's some crucial social ingredient uh, to being a woman, which means that the view that a, a woman is an adult human female is wrong. And in fact, the passage understates the extent of disagreement. Almost no experts accept that women are adult human females. Okay, so my view, well, what is my view, uh, generally in philosophy uh, as well as in, in life in general, I adopt the most boring view I can. And so in this case, my view is that the billboard is correct. And to be a woman is to be a mature, that is to say, adult human female, or as we can put it, uh, the category woman is identical to the category human female. Two ways of saying the same thing. 
Likewise, girls are immature, immature or juvenile human females. Men are mature human males. Boys are immature or juvenile human males. So on my view, then, the category woman is a biological category in an intuitive sense. Similarly for the categories girl, man, woman, and boy. All you need to be a woman on this view is to be an adult female of our species. Nothing more, nothing less. Okay, so now let me turn to three arguments for my view. So the first argument is about social and psychological ingredients. The second is about babies. And the third is about single words. Of course, that will mean nothing to you at the moment. Um, but I hope uh, um, it'll soon be clear what I, uh, what I have in mind. All you need to hold, hold on to is the idea that there are three arguments to come. OK, so the first one psychological and social ingredients. So what does it mean for a category to have a psychological ingredient? It means that you can't belong to the category unless you have a certain kind of mental or psychological competence. So for example, you can't belong to the category narcissist, can't be a narcissist, without having the capacity to think about your uh, to think about yourself that is one of many reasons why this bottle of water is not a narcissist it couldn't be it doesn't have the capacity to think about itself <laughs> and similarly for categories with social ingredients what does that mean well what that means is that you can't belong to the category without being a member of a human like society a society with a certain kind of sophistication so for example you can't be a police officer or an actor or a politician without being a member of a human-like society. In the case of police officer, you can't be a police officer without being a member of a society with a, with a legal system. If we imagine someone living off an, uh, on his own on some desert island, um, he couldn't be a, uh, a police officer. Okay, so that's what it is to have a psychological or a social ingredient. Now we can ask, do our four categories, woman, man, girl, boy, have social or psychological ingredients? Well, they don't have psychological ingredients. So you're too young to remember Terry Schiavo in the news about 20 years ago. She was, as Wikipedia notes, a woman in an irreversible, persistent vegetative state. No psychological life to speak of, but that didn't prevent Terry Schiavo from being a woman. Similarly, the categories man, girl, and boy don't have psychological ingredients, I mean, for the same reason. Okay, what about um, social ingredients? So here is Marco, uh, Marcos Rodriguez Pantoya, who was allegedly raised by wolves. Well, so let's not get hung up on the details, but uh, <laughs> the, the, the ver veracity of this claim. Let's just pretend that all that's true and suppose in particular that he was raised by wolves from birth until 25. He wasn't a member of any human-like society, <laughs> but that doesn't count. That didn't prevent him, surely, from being a boy and subsequently a man. It did prevent him from being a police officer. Couldn't have been a police officer at age 20. Politician. Um, because he was on his own in the company of wolves. But for all that, he was initially a boy and then a man. Okay, so that gives us argument one. Uh, I've just defended the first premise of argument one. There's no social or psychological ingredient to being a woman. Now, if the category woman is not any kind of social or psychological cat category, what is it then? Well, the natural alternative is that it's a biological category, specifically the category adult human female. 
So that gives us premise two. If there's no social or psychological ingredient to being a woman, then the category woman is the category adult human female. In other words, women just are adult human females. And from those two premises, it follows that the category woman is the category adult human female. And then by parity of reasoning, the category man is the category adult human male and so on. Okay, that was the first argument. Now here's the second argument about babies. Now sex is all we need to definitively identify human babies as girls or boys. The sex of the child, even in the womb, settles the matter. How the child will be raised, whether the child will be abandoned at birth by a distressed mother, whether the child will die early in infancy, these are all irrelevant. It's female, it's a girl. If it's not female, it's not a girl. So what does that show? Well, not that the category female is the category girl. I have a female cat. She belongs to the category female, but she's not a girl. So what distinguishes the girls from the other females is that the girls, plausibly, are both uh, hu human and juvenile. So if sex is all we need, it's extremely plausible that the category girl is the category juvenile human female. So the category girl is the category juvenile human female. And since one would expect a uniform treatment of our four categories, we're going to treat girl and boy as biological categories, then it's very plausible that uh, the, the adult versions, i.e. woman and man, are biological categories too. It also follows that uh, women are adult human females and men are adult human males. Okay, last argument um, about single words. So this is the plot on board Pioneer 10, which is the first spacecraft to leave our solar system in 1972. Well, it, the spacecraft was actually launched in 1972. I'm not quite sure when it exited the solar system. So the plaque um, has some basic information about humanity for aliens, designed to be readable by aliens, including where we are. Now, this has always struck me as like the most stupid, reckless thing <laughs> to do. So much. But, yeah. <laughs> But um, but anyway, for present purposes, the point is that there's hardly any information on this, uh, on this plaque. But one piece of information illustrates the most fundamental division between adult humans, between the females and the males. And for all sorts of reasons, I'm sure you can think of one. Classifying adults as either males or females is extremely useful. So surely we would expect uh, one, at least one of the roughly 6,000 human languages to have a single word with the category adult human female, just one. Um, after all, it's a very useful category to refer to and it would be economical to have a single word for purpose. So that gives us argument three. So the pre first premise is one of the um, world's languages has a single word for adult human female. And the second premise um, is supported by the linguists who study these things who report that the best candidates for such a word, that is for such for a single word that refers to the category adult human female, are woman in English and its translations, mujer in Spanish, frau in German, um, and muanamke, uh, excuse my Swahili pronunciation, in Swahili, muanamke. Um, so, it follows that uh, the word woman in English, mujer in Spanish, and so on, uh, refers to adult human female. Now, that's not 
actually the required conclusion. We don't want a conclusion about words. We want a conclusion. It's just about women, about the category woman. It is the category adult human female. But I think you can see just intuitively that once we've got this conclusion, C1, which is about words, it's just a short step to derive a conclusion which is not about words at all. Namely that the category woman is the category adult human female. Likewise, uh, the category man is the category adult human male and so on. Uh, so that is um, my opening case. And uh, now for a view from the um, opposite end of the gender spectrum. So Louise, let me stop that. Thank you so much, Alex. So now uh, help me to welcome Professor Luis Anthony. Hi, well, thanks. Uh, thanks to the, is this, I'm gonna rely on this, okay. Um, thanks to the Houston Institute very much for this invitation, this opportunity. Um, Alex and I indeed are friends. We've been friends for a long time. And um, uh, I, I always enjoy our interchanges and I think he does too. Um, okay, I, I'm going to start with a very, very sad story. So I, I warn you uh, ahead of time. Um, let's see, here we go, yeah. Um, so when I was a child, uh, I watched uh, religiously a certain locally produced television show for, for children. Um, and one of the features of this show was a quiz where you could send in a postcard, and if they drew your postcard and called you on the phone and asked you a quiz question and you got it right, you could get one of an array of prizes that they displayed every episode of the show. Well, like many kids, I was very into dinosaurs, and one of the um, one of the prizes was a model kit. This is most of you don't know about don't know how this worked, but it wasn't Legos. It was little plastic pieces that you had to glue together meticulously and then paint it with a little paintbrush and stuff of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And I wanted this in the worst way. So um, my parents, unbeknownst to me, had sent in a postcard for me and miraculously it was drawn and I was called and I was asked the quiz question and possibly with a little help from my parents, I got the quiz question right and the host of the show said, hey, Louise, what would you like us to send you? And I said, barely containing my, my excitement, the Tyrannosaurus Rex kit. And the host said, that's not a good prize for a girl. We're gonna send you a Shirley Temple doll instead. <laughs> now, I would love to tell you that I kept the doll, sold it for a fortune to a collector. In fact, I went to look for it, I couldn't find it. So this is just a picture of the, Shirley, of the inferior Shirley Temple doll. Now, what's my point? My point is that this is what gender is about. Gender is a socially determined set of expectations about what persons are like, what they want, and how they should behave what they have a right to based on their actual or presumed biological properties. Now, that's going to be my theme, that gender is a system based on actual, mostly actual, sometimes just, just presumed biological properties that um, uh, has a certain structure. And I'll be talking about what that is. But I wanna start by drawing an analogy with another word and another social property that's related to a biological property in the way I think gender is related to sex. Okay, now I'm gonna assume that you all know where babies come from, spoiler alert, a sperm uh, fertilizes uh, an egg um, and the sperm is produced by uh, at least uh, given current technology, everything's changing so rapidly, uh, comes from the testes of a man and the ovum comes from the ovaries of a woman. Um, yes, I know what I did, Alex. Uh, um, and this is a biological process. This whole reproduction thing is a biological process. Though, of course, now it is subject to various kinds of artificial, that is, human-determined manipulation. I'm going to introduce the weird term progenitor. Well, it, it is a term of English, but it's not one that we use very much. But I want to use it in a, uh, in a particular sense. 
uh, progenitor, as I want to use it uh, today, uh, is an individual who contributes a sperm or an ovum to the conception of a human being. Uh, this is a biological property. Being a progenitor is a biological property. It's a matter of a biological uh, relation. And it's determined by biological law. As things stand, you need a sperm and an ovum to produce a baby. There is cloning, so that's not exactly true, but um, the whole uh, unfolding of conception is um, a matter of biology. And it's a human universal. This is what biological reproduction is across uh, cultures, across time and space. But being a progenitor is, one, while being a progenitor is one way that a human being can be related to a child, there's another way a uh, person can be related to a child. And that is by being a parent. So what is it to be a parent? Um, this is not quite a definition, but a characterization of what it is to be a parent. Uh, roughly, an a parent is an individual responsible for the well-being of a child. It generally involves the following elements, loving the child, providing materially for the child, protecting the child, and it's a social property. And by that, I mean it's determined by social practices surrounding the rearing of children. Uh, this is often defined by law or by custom, well-understood custom. It's culturally variable, and it's a cluster property. And I'll explain exactly what I mean by a cluster property a bit later. Now, I contend that the biological property of being a progenitor is not the same property as the property of being a parent, or to use category terms, uh, the properties that put you into the category of progenitor are not the same properties as the property that puts you into the category of being a parent. Most progenitors are parents, but not all. So sperm donors, ovum donors are not generally regarded as the parents of the child that results from uh, their, their uh, donation. Uh, there are also progenitors who give up custody or who have never actually assumed custody or who have custody taken away. Um, conversely, most parents are progenitors, but not all. Adoptive parents are not progenitors of the children they adopt. And the relatives of progenitors who assume responsibility for those children are often not uh, our, our parents. Um, that can be disputed. I've, on my informal survey of asking my husband what he thinks, uh, yielded uh, an indeterminate result. So um, maybe people don't think that the relative, that, a, that an aunt or uncle who takes over responsibility uh, for a child, uh, stable responsibility for a child, durable responsibility is, is, should be classified as a parent. Okay, so what's the analogy? I wanna make the same distinction between being male or female, having a certain sex, and being a man or a woman, having a certain gender. I wanna draw the same distinction there that I draw between being a progenitor and being a parent. So, being a female and being a male are biological properties. It's a matter of uh, genetics, hormonal structure, organs, bodily form, and it's a robust human dimorphism. And here I disagree with a lot of, uh, with, with quite a few um, uh, feminist philosophers. I think that um, it really uh, has to be said that this is basically um, a bifurcation of the human species. Um, roughly 90, uh, or sorry, um, uh, no, no fewer than 90% of human beings are unambiguously male or female. There are intersex conditions, I'd be happy to, um, uh, share what little I know about that uh, with you, and Alex knows a great deal about that as well. But I think that um, it has to be conceded that it's a very, very ro robust division in the, in the human population. But being a woman, being a man, I contend are social properties. Um, what goes into being a man or a woman? Well, a division of social labor, different norms of appearance and of behavior and of occupation, uh, for uh, men and women, that is different expectations about uh, how you look, how you behave, what kinds of things you do. And often these, uh, these, these divisions are codified in law or custom. And again, we've got a cluster property, which again, I, I promise to explain. Um, 
finally, it's culturally variable what goes into being a woman or being a man in different cultures. In many cultures, um, uh, women do agricultural work. In other cultures, they do not. Um, in some cultures, women are responsible for growing uh, some kinds of crops. Uh, men are responsible for growing others and so forth. OK, so finally, what's a cluster property? Um, a cluster property is a property that underlies or organizes a cluster of other properties. It can be a biological property like sex, or it can be a social property like parenthood or gender. So parent is a cluster property. As I said, being a parent always involves having responsibility for the well-being of the child. It doesn't always entail carrying out that responsibility. Um, but beyond that, the specific properties that are considered to be um, uh, uh, key or important to parenthood vary with culture. Uh, so there are different conceptions of what uh, appropriate modes of discipline are, different views of the span of childhood, how long someone is a child before they be, are regarded as mature, uh, different views of parental responsibility, uh, different views of reciprocal duties between parent and child, uh, different views of the roles, respectively, of mother and father, and different views about how much hands-on care a parent provides. So I have in mind here the case of nannies who are generally not regarded as parents, even though they might do a great deal of the hands-on care. Um, all of these different things, the conceptions of appropriate discipline, et cetera, et cetera, are bound together by common beliefs and customs and laws in some cases, that is by the intentions and the intentional behavior of social beings. And by intentional behavior, I mean behavior that has content, beliefs, desires, attitudes. Uh, that is, it's bound together by the mental states and the intentions of social beings, us. So women and men, man, are also cluster properties, I contend. There are differential social roles assigned on the basis of presumed biological natures. Uh, there are different norms of appearance, behavior, occupation, but they always involve for women responsibility for care work and for household maintenance. I think that this is de facto a universal fact about gender organization across human societies. Also, um, I think they essential. Sorry, I think that they um, robustly involve hierarchy. Women are generally socially subordinated and have been in nearly every human culture uh, that we know about. Um, more uh, controversially, uh, many feminist theorists argue that uh, to be a woman is to be sexually objectified, to be regarded as a being that exists for the sake of the sexual pleasure of men or the sexual satisfaction of men. Um, there is cultural variability with respect to norms of appearance, permissible occupations, and the nature of dominance relations. And again, these, these properties are bound together, can be bound together by law, um, but are generally bound together by custom, but also by false beliefs. What's the false belief? Well, the false belief is in something called biological determinism, which is the view that the properties that make up gender roles in a specific culture are somehow determined by biological sex. So for example, uh, the view that women should be responsible for all caring labor, which includes not just care of children, but care of the elderly, care of, of the sick. Um, many people have the view that women should be responsible for caring labor because as females, they mostly can conceive, gestate, give birth to, and nurse children. Uh, another example, that women's having a female nature is what explains their occupying the social role that they do. And also, the idea that women are supposed to occupy these, this, these roles, that this is the function or purpose of a woman. And finally, that women are happiest when, or that it is best for them to occupy their appropriate role. Um, if you go through the history of, of Western philosophy, um, some of the greatest minds in the canon said the most embarrassingly, embarrassingly retrograde things about um, uh, what makes women happy, what women ought to do, what their nature suits them to do, and so forth and so on. Or, for example, a biological determinist view is that just because somebody's a girl, she prefers dolls to Tyrannosaurus Rex models. 
So what I'm arguing is that gender is actually a kind of social engineering, one that suppresses differences within sex categories. So the difference between me and a little girl who did want to play with dolls gets suppressed and amplifies difference between social categories. So the so the the function of gender categories is to create a similarity within the categories, girl and boy, girl and woman, and boy and uh, man, and at the same time to create a social gap between those two, the occupants of those two categories. Um, now, uh, I, I say then that sex is sex, the biological category is the material ground of gender. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, first of all, that the social division into genders, which I call a gender regime, is universal or nearly universal feature of human societies. Um, secondly, that gender regimes systematically disadvantage women relative to men. And thirdly, that the explanation for the existence of gender regimes is the difference in reproductive role. So we have other we have other oppressive regimes. Racism involves oppressive regimes, um, but there's nothing about the bio and, and racism is often constructed on the basis of presumed biological differences or manifest biological differences like skin color. But there's uh, there's no um, I think that there's no uh, reason to think that uh, a person's ending up in one or another racial category is really best explained by those biological differences. I think it's best explained by historical contingencies about which group of people conquered which other group of people. In the case of gender, I think that's not the case. I think there's a, a fact in nature, namely biological difference, that explains a great deal about uh, the nature of gender roles and also about who occupies what. Um, so again, the placement in a social category roughly is based on biological se sex, that is the social category gender, in the same way that being a parent is roughly based on uh, being a progenitor. We could talk, if you want, in Q&A, though I don't have anything informed to say about this, uh, how gender regimes arose in the first place. Okay, now I want to say a little bit about words and properties. How am I doing on time, Victor? You still got about maybe eight minutes or so. Okay. Okay, um, so I wanna say some stuff about words and their relationship to properties or category membership. Uh, I, wanna, I want us to notice that the terms parent, mother, and father are used in different ways. Sometimes those, category, those, those terms, which I'm saying are terms that designate social categories, do pick out, are used to pick out biological properties. Other times they're used to pick out social properties. Similarly, the terms man and woman sometimes pick out biological properties. I did it myself early on in the talk. I talked about a, 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 a woman's biological properties, or I can't remember what I said, but I said, I said something that used the terms woman uh, uh, to denote uh, biological females. Um, so I can see that there's that use of the term, um, but sometimes they pick out social properties. Actually, the word man has a third use, the so-called generic use, and in that use, it's supposed to cover biological males and biological females. In all of these cases, it's the context of the use of the term that makes clear which properties are being picked out. Um, in philosophy of language, this is called polysemy, which is distinguished from ambiguity, Ambigu ambiguous words have two different, it, are, an ambiguous word is a word that has two different meanings that are not related to each other. So um, uh, a bank referring to a financial institution and a bank referring to the side of a river, those two meanings don't have anything to do with each other. It's kind of an accident that we use the same sound bank to refer to both of them. Polysemy is a little bit different. It's a case where the there, there are slightly different meanings that the words can have in different contexts, but there is a relation uh, among those meanings. So a word is polysemous if the different uses of the word are closely related. So my favorite example, um, Alex is, disagrees with this, uh, my favorite example is window. So you can say the burglar came in through the window, and what you mean there is that the window refers to the aperture, to the opening. 
Uh, or you can say the window was dirty, so I washed it. And here window refers to the thing that fills the aperture. Okay, you can't say, or nobody would know what you're talking about if you said, I just washed the window and then this burglar came through it. If what you meant by, if what you meant by that wasn't that the burglar crashed through the thing you just watch, washed, it would be, it would be weird. Um, so I think man and woman and male and female are all polysemous. And we use context to figure out uh, what exactly is meant in a different um, place. Now, I also wanted to talk about my own view about gender I am a gender eliminativist. I think gender is real and it exists, but I think it shouldn't, and we should try to get rid of it. Um, analogously, a um, um, racial eliminativist, eliminativist might say race is real, it's a social category, we have to take it seriously if we're going to understand um, human life and human history, but we should get rid of it. We shouldn't classify people uh, according to what is now called race. Well, that's the way I feel about uh, gender. So my position is that gender regimes always have been and probably always will be unjust. There are some feminists who think that there could be gender in a just society. I, I don't think so. Um, I think that gender regimes are antithetical to individual liberty. They don't let little girls have Tyrannosaurus Rex models when they earn them. Um, there, are, there are even worse things. Uh, uh, I mean, it's just, it just seems to me obvious that there's no reason why your interests, your occupation, and your appearance should depend on biological reproductive related properties. Uh, gender regimes have always been oppressive to women. Uh, separate is very rarely equal, probably never. Uh, and gender serves no useful social purpose. In a sense, then, one could say, I want to eliminate men and women. I want to eliminate those categories. That's not to say, of course, that I want to eliminate males and females. Um, I love many of them of both kinds. Um, I want them to still be here, but I don't want them to have to be categorized as men and women. The challenge is, as with all matters of biological difference, how to organize the social world so that biological difference doesn't create social disadvantage. Now, just to finish some clarifications, I'm not saying that the properties that constitute maleness and femaleness are immutable. Obviously, human beings can change their internal organs, they can change their hormonal structures, and they can change their bodily form just like they can and do change all sorts of other natural properties. I put natural in quotes because sometimes the natural is contrasted with the social, but because I think human beings have our natural beings. We, we are part of the natural world. Our minds are part of the natural world. And so I think the, the social groupings and the social properties that we create are also part of the natural world. But um, by, if by natural, you mean things that are not affected by um, human um, uh, thought processes and, and um, desires are not determined by those things. Um, there are lots of natural properties that we change. Um, uh, that's, that's what human beings do. Um, but what we now call natal sex constrains such changes. So if you natally are female, that is if you are, if you're, um, if you come out of the womb with XX chromosomes and, um, uh, uh, uh uterus and ovaries, um, and you want later uh, to have facial hair, you're probably going to have to do something different than someone who comes out of the womb with an XY um, uh, chromosomal complement um, and testes. So um, if you want to have breasts and you are not XX, you're going to have to do different things than you will have to do if you are XX. Um, and if you want to have facial hair and you're XX and not XY, you have to do different things than you would have to do to get facial hair if you're XY. I'm also not saying that trans women are not women or that trans men are not men. Sometimes in this debate, insisting that there is a biological division between males and females is taken to be anti-trans. I am not anti-trans and because I think that um, males can be women and females can be men, 
that's precisely the distinction. That's precisely what the sex gender distinction provides for. So I'm going to finish there. Thank you very much. So Alex, you'll have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes for your reply. Okay, the, uh, the, yeah, the increase in the number of flags is just to symbolize that things have got a bit more complicated at this point. Um, <laughs> you know, we're only discussing the four genders, man, woman, uh, boy, and girl. If we, if we were discussing all 97 of them, we'd be here all night. Uh, okay, so I want to make three uh, points about Louise's presentation. The first one is about polysemy. The second is about a positive account of the category woman. And then the third one is about uh, biological determinism, sex or gender roles, etc. Okay, so Louise says, these are all quotes from the slides, that the words man, woman, male and female are all polysimous, and that sometimes, specifically, the terms man and woman pick out biological properties, by which I take it to mean that sometimes the word um, man is used to pick out the category adult human male, but sometimes they pick out social properties. So already that is actually like a massive concession in my direction. I mean, if you read that Stanford Encyclopedia article, uh, there's no indication that that view is uh, accepted by anyone. Um, I mean, the standard view is that there is no sense as adult, human, female, at least Louise is, I can only think of one other philosopher, and this goes back to like 2007 or something, who, who, who thinks there's a kind of ambiguity or polysemy in uh, terms like man and woman. Oh, and yeah, and, I, and as Louise kind of essentially mentioned, when she talks of properties, that's equivalent to my talk of categories. Okay, so that's what Louise thinks. So there's one standard way of setting it out, just elaborating a little bit on what Louise said. Uh, ambiguity is the umbrella notion. That's when a, a word has more than one meaning, and that's divided into homonymy, same spelling, but unrelated meanings. Louise gave the example of bank, which couldn't either mean financial institution or the edge of a river. Uh, she also mentioned that I disagree with her about whether window is ambiguous. Uh, we had a big argument over lunch about that. Never mind, <laughs> let's not go there. So that's homonymy. And then there's polysemy. However things stand with window, there are um, some less uh, controversial examples. We have the same spelling, but related meaning. So an example is mouse which can either mean the rodent or the somewhat similar looking handheld computer pointing device. Mouth, which can mean um, the part of the body where your teeth are found, or it can mean uh, the mouth of a river. And female, as Louise says, is indeed as also um, male as well, is um, uh, Polysimus. So you can buy this uh, male to female HDMI connector. It's only six bucks. You can get it tomorrow, October the seventeenth. And of course, these meeting these meanings are related because there is a somewhat abstract similarity between the um, the male and female connectors. And well, let's not go into the details. We can we can talk. Yes rather vulgar. So my the, the important point is that ambiguity in either form is easy to spot. So suppose that neither the financial sense of bank or the edge of a river sense is salient and that Louise says, I went to the bank yesterday. Then I uh, would be, it would be perfectly understandable for me to say, well, what do you mean? Do you mean you went to Bank of America or do you mean 
uh, were in Texas. Uh, I, you know, that I, she went to the uh, bank of the Colorado River. Um, another, this is an example of uh, polysemy. Um, another kind of example is where you use a word <laughs> once in a sentence where um, it must have two meanings for the sentence to make sense. And so the whole sentence sounds very weird. So, <laughs> so if you say, I fed my mouse and connected with the desktop, <laughs> then you know, the appropriate response is, no, what on, earth is, what on earth is going on here? That can't be right. Did you, what did you mean? Okay, so it's not as if ambiguity in either form, homonymy or, or, or polysemy, is you know, undetectable or only detectable under the microscope. So now let's go, go back to the quotation from Simone de Beauvoir. Here she uses the words woman and women a number of times, or rather the French word femme. Now, I would have thought both alleged meanings of woman, the social sense and the biological sense, ought to be salient when reading this passage. So people should ask when they read this passage, well, gosh, you know, what, what is her investigation about exactly? Is it about women in the social sense or is it about um, women in the biological sense? It's just like, you know, you read a page of a book about banks and, you know, you have absolutely no idea whether it's about finance or it's about <laughs> rivers or something. It's an urgent question. What, what is this book about? You know, before I buy it, I should at least find out whether it's about finance or about um, the edges of rivers. And people who read The Second Sex, I mean, there's thousands of pages of commentary on The Second Sex, and none, as far as I know, says, well, the first thing we need to do is to find out exactly what Beauvoir meant by the word woman, because she could have meant this or she could have meant the other thing. So the upshot is that I don't think polysemy of the sort <laughs> Louise postulates is at all plausible. Either woman and man have biological meanings or they have social meanings, um, they can't have both. Uh, this is a separate point. So it's true that man, for example, as Louise mentioned, is polysemous. In fact, it's given as an example of polysemy in Wikipedia. And um, uh, one meaning, as Louise mentioned, is this generic term for the human species. Now, if man had an additional social meaning, then one would expect this to be recorded by lexicographers and for it to turn up on lists of this sort. In fact, all we find is sense three, which is the one I've been concerned with, the biological sense in which man means adult male of the human species. We don't find the social sense or the social meaning. Okay, so that's what I have to say about, um, uh, about polysemy. I think that was too concessive on Louise's part. She should deny that uh, woman and man have any uses on which they pick out or any common uses on which they pick out biological categories and just stick to the social view. Anyway, let me now turn to a positive account. <clears throat> so to be a woman, Louise says the red words of quotations from Louise, to be a woman or at least to be a, well, a woman in one sense is to be a person who is presumed to have a certain biological nature. And because of that, is responsible for care work and for household maintenance. And also because of that, also because the person is presumed to have a certain biological nature, presumed to be female, something like that anyway, is subject to social subordination. So, as she says, on this view, males can be women. At least there is one sense of woman on which you can have a male woman. Now, why, why, why is that? Well, the crucial clause is A, is presumed to have a certain biological nature, is presu presumed to be female. That's all that it takes. You don't have to be female. You just have to be presumed 
to, uh, to be female or thought of as female or believed to be female. Um, I, I should emphasize that this is just an approximate rendering of Louise's view. It's definitely more complicated. And anyway, she doesn't think the precise definition of uh, categories like woman and man are available, but I think it's enough to get my objection going. So you're all too young. <laughs> the problem is you're way too young. I can see some oldsters in the audience, but uh, most of you are way too young to remember this 1993 comedy, Mrs. Doubtfire, with Robin Williams and Sally Field. So short form, the Williams character is divorced from the Sally Field character, he disguises himself as an elderly British nanny, Mrs. Doubtfire, in order to get close to his children. Now, Mrs. Doubtfire is male, but is presumed female. It's a very effective disguise. Is certainly responsible for care work, and we can stipulate is socially subordinated. So Louise's account apparently predicts that Mrs. Doubtfire is a woman, but this is the wrong result. There is no sense of woman. Doubtfire is a woman. Mrs. Doubtfire is simply a man impersonating very effectively a woman. Okay, so finally, uh, biological determinism, sex roles, and so on. So suppose, this is not to disagree with anything Louise said at the end about biological determinism, it's just to make clear that there's no tension between what Louise said and the biological view. So suppose that the category girl is the category juvenile human female. So being a girl is entirely a biological matter. Does that mean that girls should play with dolls rather than dinosaurs, or that they would be happier if they played with dolls rather than dinosaurs or anything like that? Well, I hope it's perfectly clear that the answer to that is no. And anyway, as we all know, Barbie and dinosaurs go well. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Luis, you have uh, 10 to 15 minutes for uh, your replies. Yeah. Hold on. Now I just have to. Now, why? Uh -oh. Those Barbie pictures you've got. Yeah, go I know. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, oops. Okay, there you go. Uh, thanks. Well, I have a lot of things to say in response to Alex's response to me, but um, I will stick to the arguments that he made in his presentation. Maybe we can get to some of those uh, things in, in um, Q&A. Um, so there are two things I want to say, and I want to concentrate mostly on the first one. Um, uh, I want to reply to um, uh, Alex's argument from babies that sex is all we need to differentiate uh, girls from boys. Um, and then I had a bunch of stuff to say about words and the pertinence of facts about words to uh, the debate that we're having. Um, okay, so the, the quote from Alex's slide is, sex is all we need to definitively identify human babies as girls or boys. Um, well, that's interesting. Um, if that's the case, why are all the bassinets in the hospital labeled with color-coded ID cards? Why not just ID cards? That is, if the division between girls and boys is purely biological, why is there so much social structure, so much social energy devoted to announcing the difference? The philosopher Marilyn Fry uh, made a very interesting uh, and I think astute point about this. She said that our current system of what she calls gender marking and gender announcing, that is our habit of having distinctive modes of appearance um, that uh, normatively are for girls and for boys or for men and for women, women and men. Um, she said at, at the same time that there is in, in, intense social pressure to announce your gender, to make it clear to people in the outside world, whether you're a girl or a boy, uh, a female or a male, at the same time, the norms of dress 
also make it taboo to actually display the biological basis of that difference. That's kind of weird, right? So little kids actually have trouble learning exactly what it is that makes boys and girls different from each other, makes men and women different from each other. Um, uh, the son of uh, the psychologist Sandra Bem uh, speculated that uh, the difference was that boys drink tea and girls drink coffee because that's the way it was in their house. I mean, girl, kids have to actually figure this out unless they're explicitly told about the biological basis. Very funny story about Sandra Bem's son that we could do if you ask me. Um, uh, okay, so uh, this business about all we need in order to uh, identify human babies as girls or boys, um, then raises the question, why do we need to know whether someone is a penis person or a no penis person? Um, we have different blood types. We don't need to know that. I mean, we carry donor cards, some of us, or ID cards, so that if we get mushed in a train, uh, train wreck or something, that somebody will give us the right kind of blood. Um, but why do we have this pressing, omnipresent social need to know whether someone's a boy or a girl, a man or a woman? How many of you know Pat from Saturday Night Live, another reference to the distant past? Uh, the joke was that Pat was, um, in appearance, um, not classifiable as either a man or a woman. And the sketches, it was a running gag that they, they had in different episodes. The gag was how uncomfortable socially people were when they didn't know uh, Pat's gender. Um, compare skin color and race. Skin color being the biological property and race being the social property. The, diff the biological difference between the color of people's skins only matters if you're in a race conscious society, if you're in a society that says it's socially important what that biological property is. I contend that it's only because we are in societies uh, that have gender regimes that say it's important to know whether you're dealing with a girl or a boy, um, a man or a woman. Okay, so switching to words. Um, I think the study of the lexicons of human language is really fascinating, uh, but I don't think it's of much value to this debate. Um, so Alex said, surely there'll be a human language that has a single lexical, uh, a simple lexical entry that means adult human uh, female, and indeed it does, it's woman. Well, I think that there are a lot of questions you could ask about what sorts of uh, concepts or what sorts of properties should be lexicalized, that is, should have corresponding to them a, 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 a simple word um, that uh, where your expectations might be thwarted. So for example, few if any natural languages, uh, my extensive research Googling this question um, yielded the following result, that few if any natural languages have any single common word that means human being. In English, the closest we have to that is the so-called generic man. Um, we also lack generic terms for individuals of certain animal species. Oops. Um, so let's look at terms for animals. Um, one pattern is you have a term for the male, a term for the female, and a generic term. So we've got boar and sow for pig, buck and doe for deer. I won't go through all of these. Um, but we have bull and cow for members of the species, um, uh, 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 what's it called, bas taurus. Um, but we don't have a, a word for a single individual of, of that species. And it's the same thing with man and woman. Um, the closest that you can get are things like in German, you've got the term mensch, um, but that has strong uh, connotations of, of, of referring to men. Um, and in cases of animals, we sometimes have, uh, as we do in, the, in, in, um, in English and in most languages, human languages, uh, we use a term for a male individual uh, to serve not only as a term for a male individual, but also uh, for a generic. Um, and this happens sometimes with animals too. So we've got dog versus bitch. One meaning of dog is a male um, uh, canid domestic canid, um, but it also has come to mean uh, a member of that species. Uh, peacock versus peahen. Um, 
there are some cases where the female term serves as the generic. So goose apparently um, is the uh, term for female member of that bird species uh, in con contrast with gander. And then cow is the closest thing that we have to um, a term for um, an, un, uh, an individual of um, that species uh, where the gender isn't specified. Um, some other stuff, uh, we, we uh, find that gender sex terminology for animals, um, I say gender sex terminology for animals, we don't really have gender, we don't really impute gender to animals, but anyways, gender sex terminology for animals um, very often clearly reflects human interests. And I'm, so I'm bringing this up to make the point that what we choose to have words for uh, is often a matter not just of the nature of things, but also of our interest in the nature of things. So there are a whole bunch of terms for animals that are based on re reproductive capacities or reproductive activity. So there are many uh, terms for castrated male animals. There's gelding for horse, ox for cattle, if, they're, if the cattle are used for draft. I thought an ox was a separate species, it's not. Uh, if the cattle is used for meat, then a castrated male is called a steer. Capon for chicken, weather for sheep, and boro for pig. Didn't know those words were there. Um, and then a term for an animal, a female animal who's given birth is sow. And I have an asterisk by sow because it's not, as I originally thought, just the name for any female pig. Uh, it, it has, among, among people who know their pigs, uh, you have to, the female animal has to have given birth in order to be a sow. Um, there are also terms for animals, female animals that have not given birth. So a pig that has not, female pig that has not given birth is a gilt, and a female um, member of the cattle species that has not given birth is a uh, heifer. Um, so I'm gonna stop there, and I hope that some of the, uh, I'll have an opportunity to respond to some of the things that Alex brought up in his reply to me, and he probably feels the same about my reply to him. So thanks again. Thank you, Luis, and thank you, Alex. Now we'll proceed to our Q&A session. So I think everybody has a program. Yes, 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 yes. So you probably noticed that these are really high-tech programs. Uh, there are QR codes on your programs. So if you haven't done so already, uh, turn your program to the back. In the bottom middle, there is a QR code uh, which you can scan and then use to submit questions. Uh, so scan that QR code uh, if you haven't done so already and submit our question for one or both of our presenters. We already have a number of questions uh, on the queue. So uh, I think this is a question that could be asked to, to either of them, uh, either Alex or Louise. So I'm just going to throw this out there and, and uh, see what you guys uh, think about this. So this person asks, uh, do you think that all the properties of masculinity slash femininity uh, can be explained? Uh, let's see here. Do you think that all the properties uh, of masculinity and femininity can be explained uh, in terms of biological differences? And I don't, I don't know if this is maybe uh, more natural to begin with with Alex, uh, and then we'll go with Louise. Uh, sure. That that is a. Uh... That is a great question. So roughly speaking, masculine properties or features are those typically had by males and not females, and feminine properties or features are those typically had by females. And you, I think... As a uh, as a good second wave feminist, Louise tends to think that. Um... Well, I'll say what I think. Uh... <laughs> Thank you. Very much. I'm sorry. Go I was ahead. just going to mansplain <laughs> on your behalf. It's fine. I'm used to it. Okay. Well, some say, some good old fashioned second wave feminist might think <laughs> that many of. Um, the traits associated with 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 masculinity, say you know, ambition, aggression, um, and the traits associated with femininity, like uh, being caring or nurturing or passive or something like that, um, are um, 
don't have their roots in biological differences between between males and females. Instead, the explanation of why males are typically more physically aggressive than females has to do with socialization and the way male babies are treated vis-a-vis uh, -vis female babies. Um, so that's what that's one issue. I mean, what can be said straight away, I think, is that uh, some uh, masculine properties or 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 features or some feminine properties or, or features are thoroughly due to um, social contingent social influences. So in this society, women tend to wear um, certain clothing and men tend to wear other kind other kinds of clo clothing. That's a, a masculine feminine difference in appearance. But it's not explained by biology, and in you know some other some other countries do things do things quite differently. Um, so I guess the answer. So sorry, this is a rather rambling way of saying that I think the answer to the to the question: Do all the, the aspects of fem femininity and masculinity have a biological basis? Is is no, but uh, but some surely do. But I, I guess Louise and I might might disagree about the extent to which uh... we we probably we might disagree about yeah. one or two cases. But um, look, it's not my view that all properties related to that um, are associated with masculinity or femininity um, are socially um, constructed or or largely the result of social pressures. Um, I think we, Alex and I, I don't think we've actually talked about this, but I think we might disagree about. Um, um, the explanation for um, uh, greater aggressive behavior on the part of um, men, the males, than, than women. Um, but uh, I don't have a horse in that race. My my what I'm what I'm concerned about is whatever the differences that would emerge between men and women if we didn't have gender. Why do we have to pile on? Right. In addition to whatever, I mean, I, there there are differences in the distribution and the extent of um, muscle as opposed to body fat between um, people who are male and people who are female. We don't have to pile on and insist that those people dress differently or that they uh, occupy different social roles with respect to the care of children and so forth. Um, we don't have to if the if the differences are natural. Um, we can let that be. Um, now, if it's the case, I, I think it would be uh, really too bad for men if um, they had to struggle against biological impulses to harm people that women don't have to struggle with. But that would be their cross to bear, and we would we would need as a society to provide lots of social support to prevent such um, individuals from uh, doing doing harm to each other and to to others. Um, so I think the explanation of difference is not really the point. The point is why do we have to exacerbate natural differences? Number one, two points, and secondly, um, what differences? Uh, there are that nature gives us, I think we should treat the way we treat all the differences that nature gives us. Nature didn't, didn't give us wings, but we fly. If there's a problem about some individuals um, being more violent than others, that's a problem that we have to deal with. And of course, you know, there are bell curves here. So there's some very, very violent women too, and some very pacific men. Good. Thank you, uh, Alex and Luis. So the next question, or I'm really going to cluster two questions here for both uh, for for Luis. Um, so the first question is, uh, isn't awareness of male versus female here thinking about reproductive organs, right? Isn't awareness of male versus female necessary for the continuation of the human species? So that's question one related question. Um, what does the abolition of gender actually look like? You know, and uh, this this uh, student also asks that if, if in a society that seems riddled with sexism, wouldn't ignoring uh, the categories preclude effective solutions? Should I, should I start? I think that's for you, but I'm... Oh, I see. Okay. Um, 
what would a genderless society look like? We don't know. Um, I think that a lot of the people that are currently identifying as either gender queer or non-binary or agender are um, uh, trying to help us find out. Um, and I applaud them and I celebrate them. As far as the necessity of taking account of gender when we want to um, understand human human history and understand our current situation, yes, we very much do, um, which is why I made the distinction, I think I was not very clear about this, between the view that gender exists, gender is real, it's an actual um, um, mode of uh, social organization that has had huge effects on the way human society has been organized and the way human beings conduct our, our social business. Um, I mean, you can't understand what happened during the pandemic without saying, for example, that women in the United States left their jobs at a much higher rate than men did and suffered economically more than men did from the pandemic. And they're, you know, data there and you have to collect the data in terms of men and women or you don't get the regularity. Um, but um, to be a gender elim eliminativist is to say, let's get rid of all the gratuitous uh, gender marking and gender segregation and enforcing of gender norms and see what things look like at that point. Good, uh, thank you. I could say something, please, something please, very, very please, briefly. Please, please. I, I get this is a. Oh yeah. I mean, on the one hand, I mean, this is a very interesting question, uh, but you could answer it any way you like. Um, um, whether you took Louise's position on the nature of what women are, or 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 my position, but actually here I do disagree with uh, Louise. I I think the the idea of what she calls a genderless society is some kind of fantasy that will never, never ever uh, come about. I mean, I think there are serious, significant differences between human males and human females, and those are just going to pop up in every conceivable society. Also, children naturally segregate themselves by sex from a very early age. Um, they don't need what, any. What's the um... What's the population of human children that haven't been subject to socialization from the moment of their birth up through but whatever I, but, that, um, you're, that well, you're referring true. to? Well, you're um, gathering um, your data. From. I mean, there are babies. Uh, that's true. Um, there are very few babies, children who are raised in this genderless fashion. But all I'm saying is that without, I mean, it was it's been observed by psychologists for years. I mean, the psychologist Eleanor Maccabee wrote a whole book about this. Um, you don't need any social pressure for the boys to go off on their own and the girls to go off, off on their own. I have to disagree with you on the facts here. Uh, I, for one thing, um, I mean, I, I don't I don't know Maccabee's book, and we'd have to go through it carefully, but there's lots of data that people's judgments uh, about what a baby is a baby is doing is highly sensitive to what they what gender they believe the baby is. So the same baby dressed in, um, uh, so whether so a, a baby who cries, if it's a, if the observer thinks it's a boy, is characterized as angry. If the baby is uh, believed by the observer to be a girl, then she is hurt and vulnerable. Um, uh, the same thing goes for things like uh, whether the baby's behaving um, aggressively, actively, ex uh, uh, is curious and exploring or is confused and I've forgotten some of the alternations, but um, uh, it, it's very, very hard to get the properly controlled experiment. I think you'll agree with that. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, you do see these the, the, these patterns in, in our closest relatives, I might add. So, you know, we're primates and um, you see lots of sex differences in juvenile primates that are not due to socialization. Thank you, uh, Alex and Luis. So I think the following question seems aimed more at uh, Alex, but if Luis, if you want to comment on, on this as well. So this questioner asks, um, is the cause of gender confusion related to the collapse of gender specific roles in society? And the, the spe this question wants to clarify that men and women are treated as interchangeable now more than ever? 
I think the right. So I, I, I suspect maybe the question I could like chime in remotely. I suspect that gender confusion might be a reference to um, <laughs> the increase in the diagnosis of gender dysphoria mm -hmm. in children and adolescents. There certainly has been a large increase in that uh, in uh, across uh, Europe and uh, America. And it's not certainly not clear what the explanation for that for that rise is. Um, and it's quite dramatic. It's you know, like as far as clinics go, yeah. it's been maybe a factor of forty um over the last fifteen, twenty years or so. Um I, I'm really not sure what the explanation for that is. I don't quite understand why the alleged idea that men and women are interchangeable would be an explanation because you would have thought if anything the idea that men and women are interchangeable would um reduce felt discomfort with one's one's bodily sex um so indeed one 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 might expect that in louise's hypothetical genderless society um there would be a lot less discomfort with um with, with with one's bodily segment. I will say something that um I, I um uh, I'm I am not at all qualified to speak about gender dysphoria. Um I mean I've done I've done reading and tried to be responsible in um paying attention to data when I could. Um but one statistic and Alex tell me if this is your understanding too is that there are a great many more um, individuals who are natally female wanting to transition either to a non-binary identity or um, uh, identity as a boy than uh, the reverse. And some of the statistics I've seen are about 75% of, uh, I see some nods, so I guess other people have seen this data too. This concerns me a lot because I'm very worried that especially young adolescent um, individuals who are natively girls just don't want to be subject to the things they're subject to if they, if they undergo female puberty. And that would be a very terrible thing. So a, not rather than gender becoming more fluid, um, I am very concerned that at least for some individuals uh, uh, who are natally female, there is um, flight from the very significant challenges our society poses for a person who develops breasts and begins to menstruate. So I just register that as a concern that I have. Yeah, that's right. I, that, that's that's my understanding as well. So the the um, the classic. Uh, presentations of gender dysphoria uh, were either early onset, like very young children, usually most m mostly males, feeling uh, or expressing discomfort with their sexed bodies and classification as as boys, or else late onset, uh, where m mostly males would would transition, uh, sometimes quite 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 late in life. Um, and then recently, there seems to have been a new clinical phenomenon, which has controversially been labeled, I'm sure many people have heard it, controversially labeled rapid onset gender dysphoria. This is labeled by the physician Lisa Littman in a paper published in 2018, I think, which was very controversial. Anyway, this new phenomenon whereby um, adolescent females with no prior history of gender dysphoria, suddenly develop discomfort with their sexed bodies, and that's um, that's largely responsible, I think, for the for the rise in uh, diagnoses in in clinics. And yeah, it's um, I mean, given that we're talking about serious, potentially serious medical interventions, the um, uh 
the giving of uh, puberty blockers um, to halt uh, puberty later down the line, uh, hormonal treatments or or surgeries which can impair or just destroy fertility and have other health issues. And ideally, all things being equal, I would have thought, you know, you want to avoid uh, going anywhere near a, a hospital or a surgeon if you possibly can. Um, so that's, I, I think, concerning. Can, can I just say, too, that my own... I, I'm kind of in despair about all of this because I think there are serious questions about uh, the, the, the matters that Alex was raising. Uh, about safety, about uh, the ability of a 10 or 11 year old to make decisions that are going to have major effects on a number of important aspects of their lives. Um, and it pains me deeply that this debate has become so politicized. And I don't think it's a, the left and the right are equally responsible. I think it's the right, and I think they are cynically exploiting the issue um, uh, for political reasons. And this is not something that 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 can be or should be um, hashed out in the uh, uh, in state legislatures by politicians. And I think that the the highly politicized character that this that, that, that these issues have been given. Um, is working to the to the very severe detriment of of um, thousands, possibly millions of children and parents um, and and friends uh, who are who are involved in the making of these decisions. And I think it's it's shameful, and it should just stop. Thank you. Uh, this next questioner asks, and this is for um, I guess it could be for both for either of them. Uh, does the idea of someone uh, making a gender transition to better align with their internal sense of self, doesn't that ultimately serve to bol uh, bolster gender roles or stereotypes? Let me go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure. um, this is a common feminist criticism, so you, you yeah. should. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do think that if gender roles didn't exist, um, I absolutely don't know from the inside what it is to have a gender identity in the sense in which many trans people talk about having a gender identity. I can say as a child, you saw from my very, very sad story, that I didn't always conform to the expectations about um, that were sort of um, had of me um, in virtue of being uh, female. Um, one of the ones I had the hardest time with was that girls aren't supposed to argue with people. <laughs> you forget that. Um, that's why I found philosophy, fortunately. But uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Um, I, I don't think I have a robust gender identity in the sense that um, uh, many people talk about having a gender identity. So I'm not sure from the inside what it means. Um, I, I have two uh, children who are uh, now grown. Um, my son's 40, but I was 12 years old when I had him. Um, so I'm not that old. Don't think I'm that old. Um, and um, our general parenting uh, strategy was to let the kids do basically whatever they wanted. So um, my son um, wore pink clothes and sequins and painted his fingernails and so forth, but there never seemed to be uh, any sense that he had that he wasn't a boy. Similarly, my daughter did lots of boy things. Um, I don't know what their experience would be or how they'd characterize their own experience if they were children uh, at now at this moment. So I don't know, but I, I, am, I am worried about if, the, if, if gender identity is a matter of inhabiting one of these roles that's part of a gender regime. Um, you know, I, I would like to live in a world where people can have any kind of body and 
do whatever they wanted and dress however they wanted and um, have interests of whatever kind they wanted, um, decorate themselves or not decorate themselves as they saw fit. Um, so I, I, I am, I, I do think that uh, advocating for the elimination of gender um, might might be uh, a position that um, is uh, um, quite antithetical to and painful for uh, trans people. Um, I I need to I need to raise my own consciousness about their experience, um, but that's the position that I have. I mean, I do think this criticism is actually quite um, uh, quite unfair. I mean, I didn't think... Um, Can I just say, I have yeah. not... I've been, I was criticized by one student once yeah. for advocating gender unlimitedism. She was a trans uh, woman and said that I was annihilating her identity. But other than that, I have not had any social difficulty in articulating my views. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I just meant just speaking to the, the the question, which is an excellent one about whether transitioning reinforces gender stereotypes, which presumably the subject was that this would be a bad thing. I think, on, I mean, on the one hand, really, there are so few people tra transitioning; it's hard to see how they could have had much of an effect. And then if you just think about some particular cases, like the trans man, Elliot Page, it's most implausible that uh, Elliot Page is doing his part to reinforce pernicious stereotypes of, of masculinity. And even if you take someone on the other side, the trans woman, Laverne Cox, yeah, sure, she's pretty feminine and so on, but it's just like no more overtly or stereotypically feminine than than any other actress. So I I think trans people are getting a bad rap on this uh, on this score. Thank you. So this is a question for um, Alex. Uh, let's see here. I think I lost. Oh, here we go. Uh, for Alex, uh, how would you define gender? Uh, would you, you would you differentiate between gender and sex or not? Okay, that is an excellent question. This is one of my, uh, my one of my big hobby horses, and um, I have. Uh, it, 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 I mean, I, I don't mean to wail on Louise, Louise again, but many second wave feminists find it impossible to give up the word gender as some like technical term for something that is not sex. So there is the sex so-called sex gender distinction. And it, it is undeniably true that there are many distinctions that you might want to call the sex gender distinction. For example, there is the, the distinction between sex on the one hand and masculinity and femininity on the other. Obviously, the two should not be confused. Females can be masculine, males can be feminine. Some people call this the sex gender distinction, but that actually goes back to the UCLA psychiatrist Robert Stoller, who wrote a famous book called Sex and Gender in 1968. Um, and then there are other uses of the word gender, and Louise has exhibited them. Uh, now, there's also uh, the use of gender uh, to mean sex. Um, you can use gender just as a synonym for sex, and many questions like, what is your gender, is the are essentially just the question, what is your sex? Are you, uh, are you male or female? So I think if you want to distinguish various things from sex, do not use the word gender to do it. It's just way too confusing. No one has any idea what you're talking about. Uh, if you want to distinguish sex from masculinity and femininity, then just use the words masculinity, masculinity and femininity. If you want to distinguish uh, sex from gender identity, then don't, as some people do, use the phrase, sorry, use the single word gender for gender identity. Just say gender identity. Or if you want to talk of gender roles, use the phrase gender roles. Don't use the single word gender. So my own pre prescription is never use the word gender uh, alone as anything uh, other than a synonym for sex, and then things get a lot clearer. Yeah, I don't agree with that. Um, I think it's, I think, 
using gender to refer to. I mean, look, you know, to some extent, feminists are trying to prescribe the use of ordinary terms to mark a distinction that they they are they are not the best tools for marking. Um, that's why we write all this stuff and say stuff like, by the term gender, I mean to refer to, and then we tell you what we're talking about, a system that um, uh, slots people into social roles according to their actual or presumed uh, biological properties. Um, I, I don't find it confusing. Can, can I, I mean, I know we're running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I wanted to ask you just one thing. Yeah. Well, but you wanted to ask me one thing. <laughs> oh. oh, well, I wanted to complain about your criterion of polysemy. Um, uh, if that's the criterion, I wondered if you could tell me um, what uh, I, I want to, uh, I have two sentences for you and I want you to tell me if the, what the terms men and women mean in these contexts. Um, uh, in one of the founding documents of the United States, there was the line, all men are created equal. Does that mean all biologically, all adult? Um, but that's the generic. The, the, oh, oh, but but so is it clear <laughs> that they meant that they meant the generic man? They didn't mean to include women when they laid out the rights. I think it's controversial whether they were really they were. I mean, there's the generic. Okay, well sense. then it's all right. But so, okay, I defer okay, so to your I defer to your constitutional scholarship. Then I always thought oh, the rule men. I thought I always thought the rule men are created equal. That was the, 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 oh, the oh, oh, no, that's what we're told. That's what we're told. We're told that it's generic. But I mean, if you look at if you look at um, philosophers like Locke and Hume and Kant and Ar well, Aristotle used Greek words inconveniently, but um, but uh, um, uh, Locke and, and Kant used German. Oh my God, don't get me started. <laughs> Um, but uh, if you look at their use of the uh, of the word man, if they're speaking English or the um, um, uh, the words in their language that that play the same linguistic role, um, you'll you'll hear you'll hear it said that when Aristotle talked about man being a rational animal, he was talking about all human beings. He was using generic sense. But then when you look at the details, it turns out that he thinks that women don't have the same um person making capacities that men do so what's he mean men generically or men specifically but that's not the best one um in the opening line of book two of the second sex by simone de beauvoir yes. um i don't know how many pages into the 895 page volume it is uh there's i mean i just line. i ever read i only read the introduction okay <laughs> Well, you ought to get to book two. Um, the opening line is, one is not born, but becomes a woman. Yes. Does context make clear what she's talking about? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, she, she's, I, I mean, I think that Simone de Beauvoir, who said on a number of occasions when she was asked, what is a woman? This is not in the book, but uh, she replied, a woman is a human being with a certain physiology. She take it to mean essentially a woman is an adult human female that was her well okay, i think that was her then, view and okay. then i think one is but then what the, does the... she mean when she said I'm, I'm i'm addressing yeah. the the um criterion of polysemy that you advanced which was that the uh um it's always clear which sense is being used and i'm claiming it's not always clear well i i i deny that there is this other sense but, but what does uh, but... she mean then by one is not born but becomes because woman? what she means what... just mean the junk girl no, no, no. Uh, uh, right. Obviously, no, that's right. I mean, I think I think what she means, and it's clear if you read the uh, the rest the rest of that quotation about no economic or blah 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 destiny. So you did. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, it's clear that she means. I think she means the the second wave feminist thing, which is that um, uh, a lot of the stereotypical features of uh, of women are in fact not due to what uh, Beauvoir called the eternal feminine and not due to her 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 nature but they're sort of imposed or constructed by 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 society yeah. so in that sense you in, in that sense you aren't uh, you aren't you aren't born, but, born, but born a woman. you're not born you you are not destined to grow up to be a stereotypical uh passive nurturing caring, unambitious woman. Well, I think, okay, 
I think she, she also might mean that to be a woman is to have your social life constructed in a certain way um, and to have your psychology invaded in a certain way. Um, that is to uh, to become a woman is to come to occupy a socially specified yeah. role. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I absolutely can see that some people, in fact, including Judith Butler, have read that passage in in exactly that way. Can I? Can I? Uh, come on. Can I just ask you about uh, Mrs. Doubtfire? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Spoiler alert: Mrs. Doubtfire wasn't a woman. She was a man who was pretending to be a woman. There's no pretending to occupy a social role is not the same thing as occupying a social role. But she, but I thought Mrs. Doubtfire met your criteria for uh, for for being a woman. So she was presumed. It's not like up to me. Yeah. Whether whether people presume that yeah. I'm male or, or occupying the social yeah. role is the important thing, and occupying the social role means, among other things, being subject to certain norms, be having certain conditionals be true of you. So, um, if Mrs. Doubt, if a woman um, was, um, uh, if if Mrs. Doubtfire was a woman, um, then uh, she wouldn't. Um, she wouldn't be taking care to make sure that nobody saw her ap applying her prostheses and makeup. She was pretending. There was pretense. You can pretend to. I can pretend to be a policeman. I can pretend to be a policeman, and I can do it while actually not just looking like a policeman, but I can pretend to actual. I mean, I can actually go about the things that um, uh, police officers do. But it's pretense. But take, but suppose, suppose I am in fact a, a um, I'm, 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 I'm uh, a woman. Surely you would, you, you, this, this should be possible on your view. Um, I'm a woman, um, but I really don't look very much like a woman at all. Yep. Well, um, I have sort of. I, I have a very flat chest. I have a masculine face. Maybe I have polycystic ovarian syndrome. So I, so I have uh, facial hair, um, and so I, um, in the privacy of my own home, apply various prostheses and whatnot, so I can more convincingly appear as a woman. Um, what, well, I mean, that that's might, obviously that might be a woman. I mean, many women, yeah, I know, oh, but... women have to do an awful lot of stuff to, to look like women. That's not, that's Well, not so does issue. Mrs. Delphine. Right, right. Um, but she's... Oh, but just imagine, or, or, do, or what, imagine the no the... Sorry, sorry. Um, no, go ahead. You go ahead. Well, I mean, imagine that it, it's not, so we're not talking about like some trans person but Im imagine that um robin williams you know took method acting to the extreme and had facial <laughs> feminization surgery and and breast implants and even you know suppressed his testosterone mm -hmm. and took estrogen and whatever just to really get into the role <laughs> right yeah. he wouldn't be a woman um because why oh you think he would be no, I'm just asking you what your basis is for saying that he's not. Well, I, I would have thought... Um, because he still has his penis? No, let's not get hung up on penises or oh. genitals. I mean, you know... Well, I mean, I mean, there is, is I mean, boys can be born without penises. There's like yes. genital absence of okay. penis. But, 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 but what is it that makes him not a woman on that you think is so obvious? Well, I, I, I would have thought that... Um, I mean, as you were just saying um if 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 i disguise myself as a woman uh like the um the scarlet pimpernel um sorry none of you know about that but um if i disguise myself as uh as a woman well then i just have disguised myself as a woman i'm just a man like as it were Inverted pretending work. pretending to be a woman now of course disguises can be more or less extreme or you know um permanent and so surely it doesn't make any difference whether whether I have a bit of surgery or something, as opposed to just having like the well, fake boobs. Why why don't I get some real ones? Well, I mean I'm that's not going to make any difference. Try, I'm trying to 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 get you to say what is the appearance reality distinction here. I mean, if Mrs. Doubtfire, if the character, so the character 
wants to get back with his ex-wife and be in the lives of yeah. his children. So he disguises himself yeah. as a as a nanny. Um, um, but suppose he just said, I'm going to go for it. Yeah. I'm going to become a woman. Okay. Right. So part of the difference would be his intention, right? In, I want to inhabit the social role fully and completely. But as that, opposed to just saying, I want to pretend to inhabit it for this limited purpose. Okay. That wasn't on your slide. But I mean, surely you don't want to say that if someone just has um, a kind of art project of, it's sort of performance art. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to be a woman as, uh, as um, or at any rate, I'm going to get as close as I possibly can to being a woman. It's not, I don't have gender dysphoria or anything like that. I don't think I have some misaligned gender identity or whatever. I'm just one of these, you know, performance artists who like, who likes to, um, you know, put nails through his tongue or turn myself into a lizard man or something like that. <laughs> I, uh, if I did all that, I wouldn't, I, I, I would be a woman on your view. I would literally be a woman. So, uh, Louise, could I give you a chance to reply? Sorry, you I'm might, sorry. You might need to, um, there, by the way, there's a lot of great questions in the Q&A, and it's like, we could probably go for another hour, but, uh, but, but please, so, so you're good. Yeah. I'm, okay. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Uh, no, so it, it's it's um, this has been awesome. It's great. Uh, it's really great to to be able to have have this conversation uh, with both of you. Uh, as I often tell my students, time flies when you're philosophizing. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, just about that time. So before uh, we close, just I got a couple a uh, couple of items. So first off, uh, just a couple of thank yous are in order. So first off. Thank yous uh, to uh, the board members of the Houston Institute, uh, Mark Dulworth, uh, Jeff Polzer, Davis Thames, um, everybody who's here uh, from the board, just delighted, uh, delighted uh, for all your support. Thank you for making this possible. Thank you also to all our wonderful student volunteers. So you've, you've seen them around uh, with their name tags, uh, dressed like they're going to an interview. Those have been some of our awesome uh, Houston Institute students who have not only uh, been enjoying uh, the philosophizing very much, but they've also been volunteering their time to help make this philosophizing possible. So if you see a student with a name tag, be sure to thank them. Uh, thanks especially to uh, Jacob Kasner and Gabrielle Allen, our president and vice president uh, of the Houston Institute. You do a lot for us.